And so, as I've discussed in the uh, census, census part of the video, the name Daisy Renton is chosen symbolically. Daisy to suggest freshness and vulnerability, this idea of being uprooted and destined to fade and wilt and die, and Renton, this idea that she is for rent, even though she doesn't actually publicly ask for money from the men she meets, that can be the only possible end to the relationships. She's not a prostitute here in that she isn't um, for hire. You can't just buy her services for an hour or half an hour. But she is rented out by Gerald and rented out by Eric for long periods of time. Because she has chosen this name for herself, we might also suppose that partly this is her intention. She knows that is the only way for her to survive, and in her own mind is perhaps two or three rungs up the ladder from prostitution. For her it must be a terrible compromise, which in the end um, she feels disgusted at and kills herself with disinfectant. It's worth considering why Priestley is so particular about the months and dates in which people met this girl. And uh, one reason is that uh, it means it could all be the same girl. The chronology always matches up. And again, we find that there's possibly six weeks between being sacked from Millwards and her going to the Palace Bar. And that would be just the kind of time that she might survive on any kind of wages that she'd saved at Millwards. Priestley is also making a wider point here. He's saying that that's how vulnerable working women are. It only takes six weeks to take them from being morally respectable people to people who have to do something they don't agree with in order to survive. This is an incredibly unfair society, and it's a society that desperately needs the welfare state, which the um, Labour government is going to strengthen just after the production of this play. And it's the Labour government that Priestley wants to bring to power and uh, get support for in his message in this play. Priestley also uses Eva to point out the corruption of the rich and the corruption in men. Uh, so Gerald goes to the palace bar knowing it's a favourite haunt of women of the town. And this is a euphemism for prostitution. And the very act of having a euphemism means that it's easier to hide. Berlin's reaction is to show just how necessary he thinks it is to hide it. He doesn't even want to mention this subject in front of Sheila, which is deeply ironic because he's really saying, I don't want my daughter to know what you, Gerald, my future son-in-law, have been doing, having sex with prostitutes, and will probably keep on doing once you're married. So he's using Eva to show how working-class women are exploited, but also to show how even wives of the rich are exploited by the behaviour of their husbands, and here, their fathers. It's very common for students to see Eva as a way of priestly attacking the class system. It's much less common for students to comment on her role in attacking the patriarchy. A patriarchy is any society run by men, excluding women from power. And so Priestley here is attacking men quite directly through Eva. Gerald gives us a physical description of Eva. She looked quite different to the other women in the bar who are offering themselves presumably for sex. She was very pretty with soft brown hair and big dark eyes. Uh, the dark eyes were mentioned earlier, although I didn't mention it in this video, by Sheila when describing the girl she had sacked from Millwards. And Priestley is very clearly hinting that this is probably the same girl. Remember that Eric isn't here, but Burling is. So Burling would also recognise this as a description of Eva Smith. Priestley gives this description to Gerald because it's going to be Gerald 
who denies that it's all one girl. So he does this to point out Gerald's hypocrisy. He will cling on to any belief so long as he can believe he is less guilty. The hypocrisy of men is also revealed in Gerald's line here. I hate those hard-eyed, dough-faced women. These are women he must have seen often. In other words, he must frequently visit the palace bar. Uh, Meeting Eva does not seem to be a one-off chance random event. seems to be a pattern of behaviour. And what attracts Gerald to Eva is how she's young and fresh. In other words, she's vulnerable and corruptible. Um, She's charming, so he can feel better about himself for exploiting her, and altogether out of place there. Um, So she is worth saving, if you like, because she is someone that hasn't been ruined by sex with lots of other men. Gerald is going to claim that he was only thinking of Eva's welfare, but let's look at how he describes her twice here, the girl and the girl. To him, that is much more important than her name, Daisy Renton. It's the fact that she's young and feminine and someone that he can exploit that is important to him not the real person, Daisy Renton, who he eventually abandons. This seems all the more cruel when he says she gave me a glance that was nothing less than a cry for help, but his help has come with conditions. Um, He's going to put her up in lodgings, but the unspoken condition is, have sex with me or you lose the lodging. The inspector is going to say that Gerald has treated... Eva quite well. But let's examine what he actually does. First, he takes her for a drink or two. In other words, he's getting her drunk because he wants to have sex with her. The inspector points out here, very carefully, that in later times she's obviously become much more like an alcoholic. Did she drink much at the time? So by the time she meets Eric, she's obviously become much more dependent on drink and Gerald has partly led her there. He points out that all she wanted was to talk. She wanted a little friendliness. Um, Not a friend, but a little friendliness. In other words, he's only offering her a very little in return for sex. Uh, Then Priestley has Gerald reveal many of the facts that we've already found out about Eva. She'd lost both parents... Uh, She'd had a job and had to leave after a strike, exactly like Eva, and something about the shop too. Um, These can't be coincidences. It's very clear that Gerald has been involved with Eva Smith. And this is the same girl that Burling and Sheila Burling have exploited. So Priestley is using Eva to point out Gerald's hypocrisy. All the more so because these are Gerald's own words, which he's later going to deny. And then finally, we've got this delightful moment of timing. He notices that at the moment she was actually hungry, and that's why she's uh, getting drunk with this drink. And the inspector says, ah, and then you decided to keep her as your mistress. In other words, finding out how vulnerable she was, and how close to um, starvation, if you like, is what makes Gerald then offer her his help, because she can't refuse it, and he decides to make her his mistress. Uh, Two nights later, his suspicions or hopes are confirmed. She hadn't a penny and was going to get turned out of the miserable back room she had, so she has literally nowhere to turn other than to him. This gives him all the bargaining power to do with her as he wants. Because she is not in a position to refuse. The only thing she can do, instead of becoming his mistress, appears to turn to, to be to turn to prostitution. Gerald is the lesser of two evils. And now we can see how Daisy is for rent. So I insisted on Daisy moving into these rooms and I made her take some money to keep her going there. So although Daisy is desperate for money, she 
cannot ask for it. She wants to preserve the illusion that this is not a financial arrangement and that it's based on feeling. Gerald completely exploits her feelings. In its return for her being young and pretty, um, he exploits the fact that she is warm-hearted and generous towards him and intensely grateful. In other words, all the advantages are ones that he holds. I became at once the most important person in her life, and he exploits her that way. And Priestley is pointing out that for a vulnerable young woman, um, there is no equality in life. She's always in an unequal relationship with men, because they hold all the power. Again, Gerald is very precise about the chronology. So they split up in the first week of September. This is going to be important because it makes it very, very plausible that the woman that uh, has a relationship with Eric is in fact the same woman. He lies to himself here, or at least tells a partial truth. Daisy knew it was coming to an end. Um, this kind of suggests that um, she's accepting of it um, because the relationship was ending. But that's not exactly how it would have worked. Gerald is bringing it to an end. Why? Because his friend is coming back from Canada and will want his lodgings back. In other words, the feelings that Gerald has for Eva are so small that he would not even rent her an alternative place. She is worth no more money to him than he is already paying. They both maintain the illusion that this has not been a financial arrangement. And she, Eva, is very gallant about it. She is the one who most needs to maintain that illusion because she does not want to see herself as selling herself for sex. But at this moment she must realise how cheaply Gerald has valued her. Once the property which was free is no longer available, she is simply discarded with. Priestley is quite subtle in blaming Gerald for this. Um, he gets Gerald to point out that she didn't blame me at all. And Gerald takes comfort in the fact that she knew it couldn't last. In other words, she knew that Gerald would exploit her. And in Gerald's mind, this makes it okay. Even though she told me she'd never been happier. She'd been, uh, she'd been happier than she'd ever been before. So Gerald has given her the best time of her life, and yet that was an illusion. It was just a financial arrangement on his part. Again, we can see just how much he has exploited her. She'd saved a little money during the summer. She'd lived very economically on what I'd allowed her. In other words, he was giving her very little money. She had to make savings within what she was spending in order to have savings for later. And why did she need to save for later? Because she knew Gerald was exploiting her. The fact that she loved him would count for nothing. In the end, he's given her a parting gift of money to see her through to the end of the year. This is perhaps a way of saving his conscience. In the end, Sheila has only money enough for two months away from the city. There is a Strong symbolism here in choosing to leave the city and move to a seaside place. We might associate this with holiday and lack of work, but we also might associate it with the sea and this idea of being cleansed, which um, Eva brings us back to by her choice of suicide method with the disinfectant. Priestley now points out that women's lives are so exploited that the very happiest memory could still be based on an exploitation. So she has gone to remember all that had happened between them, but to treasure that memory, even though he was simply entering into a financial arrangement to use her when it suited him. The diary then becomes deeply ironic. It's not a story that she wants posterity and priestly to tell. It's just a way of reliving those happy times and making them last longer in her own mind. 
Priestley then uses this devastating contrast. There's never been anything as good, and probably never will be again, um, for Eva. And Gerald's reaction, well, I never saw her again. He cuts her off totally, without any regret, um, at the pain he must have caused her. Here, Eva is a symbol not just for how the ruling classes treat the working classes, but for how men exploit and abuse women.